Prior to draining the pond, Cleveland Metro Park's aquatic biologists conducted a fish salvage where they electroshocked and harvested over 1,400 sport fish, including bluegill, largemouth bass, and crappie, and then took those fish and used them to stock ponds within the Cleveland Metro Park's reservation system. Draining the Alouette Plume Lake was a multi-step process that began shortly after it was determined that the dam needed to be removed. The first step involved siphoning the water through the existing 27-inch culvert under Morley Road to the downstream side, followed by the installation of an 8-inch pump. The process to drain approximately 13 feet of water was completed over an 8-week period. One hundred and twenty-seven feet of sixty-inch steel conduit was installed by means of the jack and bore process, which pushes the pipe by hydraulics and then bores out the material, leaving behind a culvert. Due to some mechanical issues and unforeseen foreign debris in the embankment, the contractor was only able to install an average of five linear feet per day. However, due to the depth of the pipe, the process still shortened the length of the project and made it possible for traffic to drive on Morley Road during construction. The reason this project started to happen was we had a failing culvert under the road here. You can see where the sheet piling is. Um, and the culvert was actually, was probably in this original location. Again, the culvert was at the same elevation as the stream bed. And when they put in this new culvert, they extended it out about uh, 20 feet. And they actually dropped it about six or seven feet. So it was one of the, again, the, the sort of the, the tricky things on how we could design a project to get in on a budget but deal with this this new culvert elevation so that's why uh, again keeping the the lake bed sort of as the stream elevation but using this this sort of drop structure behind you to get the stream down into the culvert um, as opposed to regrading the stream all the way back through So what we're looking at here is the old lake bed. And essentially, uh, there used to be a culvert right where I was standing um, at the same elevation of the lake bed. There was a drop inlet structure. And when the drop inlet structure uh, was taken out, but the culvert is now six feet below the original lake bed. So in terms of looking at how we could restore this stream for the given budget, the idea was that we would keep the stream at the existing lake bed and then drop it down through this uh, cascade structure right at the end. Um, in an ideal world, what we would have done was grade back the stream in the floodplain and create a nice uh, stable slope to allow fish passage, but given the, the extensive cost it would have been to dewater and haul off all of this sediment, it was just wasn't feasible. And also, the idea with this design is one of the things we're looking to reduces the amount of sediment moving downstream. Once the drop inlet structure was removed, uh, the stream started cutting back and we started to see a lot of sedimentation downstream. So the idea is we keep the stream at sort of this old lake bed, but we lock it in place through these structures. So essentially you'll see some of these little areas where you've got a lot of rocks in the stream. We call those grade control structures or riffles. It's essentially locking in that elevation of the stream so it's not going to erode down any further. And then we've placed these logs out in the floodplain perpendicular to the flow, kind of uh, as um, a, a, another form of grade control structure. Um, and once the water comes up, it'll hit those log sills, slow down, drop out its sediment. Um, the floodplain will be utilized by the flows. Um, another thing we're doing as part of this um, is trying to revegetate this and turn this back into historically it would have been a forest there was no pond here it was a stream so what we're doing is we're using a lot of what we call bioengineering material it's something that we use in a lot of our stream restoration projects it's typically willows and dogwoods and sycamores and button bush and you can just take a cutting from this plant a simple post and put it in the ground and it's going to grow into a tree or shrub so it's another way to to uh, take your dollar as far as you can as opposed to buying expensive potted material uh, the posts uh, 
only cost a couple dollars. So we've got probably close to a thousand um, live stakes and posts that are going in through here. You can see some of the posts already behind the log sills. So every one of those is going to grow into a tree. So the idea is to really heavily vegetate this stream quarter. You can see the areas with the straw that's already been seeded with a native wetland mix. Um, and once this, this sort of riparian corridor starts to, to grow up, it's going to shade out some of the invasive plants we have here. So over on the, the right here, you can see the plant kind of has a feathery top. That's called Phragmites, or common reed. It's a very aggressive plant. You can see it's spreading up into the neighbor's yard there. And then a lot of this, this uh, yellow plant, the last year's leaves that are, that are uh, lying down, that's called narrowleaf cattail. And these plants are very aggressive. They're not from this country, and they essentially form a monoculture. They'll dominate the landscape. So the idea is once we get our trees and shrubs established, those two plants are shade intolerant. They don't deal with shade. So over time, especially these, these species that we're using, willows and dogwoods and sycamores, they're very fast growing. So you know, in a couple years, we should get vegetation probably as tall as me, um, and then again, start to outcompete some of those invasive plants. The approach here, Given we were in an old lake bed, we had probably about four feet of unconsolidated sediment, essentially what we were calling black mayonnaise. Last year, once they dewatered uh, de this, you would come out, you'd sink into your knee right away. So we decided we would let the, uh, the site kind of sit and dewater for a season, because um, at that time it was impossible to even walk across the site without sinking in, let alone drive a piece of equipment. And now to this day, you can walk across it, but there's still some areas where, where you can sink in. It's, it's amazing when you're out there and the, the excavator is pushing in one of those sill logs, it feels like you're standing on jello. You can kind of feel the ground ripple beneath you. And so we knew it was going to be difficult for construction. So what we wanted to do was create a road, an access road, right at the side of the lake here where we could excavate a little bit off of that hill slope, create a stable road, and then the contractor would put wooden mats on that so they could drive on it and then they'd extend those mats out to where all these little riffle structures are essentially create these little fingers where they could go out place the rock and then come back onto this access road again a way to minimize disturbance again we had the stream bed kind of already formed we did a couple little manipulations to it um, and one of the great things about this project is it was a design build project as opposed to a design bid build Whereas design build, we took it to about 60%, and it's uh, one of those types of, of projects where you can just make little tweaks in the field and change things, as opposed to a design bid build where you had to get a change order and go through this huge hassle and, and recreate a set of plans. But here, you know, just between last year and this year, the stream channel here moved about 15 feet. So what we had on the survey wasn't even true to the field. So, you know, we had a couple shifts in the field where we had to move some riffles. Um, but right now everything everything's going really well contractor is working on the the last upstream riffle right now they're finishing that up they're putting in the rock sill um, and they're starting to put in some of the bioengineering material you've got the posts and live states which are soaking in the stream right now uh, they've installed some on the sills um, so we're kind of in the process of wrapping up um, once they get that that last sill done once they'll do they'll start backing out They'll pull those wood mats out. They'll regrade this road out. Um, if we have any downed uh, trees from the grading back there, what we'll do is we'll, we'll essentially plant those in the floodplain. They're called standing snags. You can see one right over there um, to the right of the road. It's great for habitat, um, woodpeckers, birds. It's a great perch for raptors and things like that. But it's another way to add habitat to, to this project because that's Again, one of our main goals, by putting in these cobble riffles, we're creating a lot of aquatic habitat for macroinvertebrates and fish. And then all the vegetation that we're putting in is going to be tremendous habitat within this riparian corridor. These are rolls of, of what we call uh, core matting or core fiber. It's actually a, a, a coconut fiber. And we use these in a lot of our stream restoration projects where we might have the potential for some bank erosion. It's sort of a um, less obtrusive form of bank stabilization as opposed to a rock and essentially we'll put this matting down and then we'll use uh, plant material to help stabilize the bank but the core matting will stabilize it before the the roots on that plant material uh, take hold and we've used this in an area where we had to grade the channel away from the stream bank we also have 
core matting in some of these sill logs, these uh, core fiber logs as a way to um, stabilize some of the, the stream restoration structures we've put in. Um, it's also a way to help back up water in the floodplain. And so when we walk down, you'll see some of those core logs out in the floodplain. It's difficult to see, but just two weeks after installing the live stakes, small buds were beginning to form. And then, just six weeks later, the site is green and lush and serving as a habitat for birds and aquatic species. In addition, the area has experienced two high-intensity rainfalls in which the stream structures and log placements had functioned as designed. The Lake County Engineer's Office and project team are pleased with the results of the stream restoration project.